Hey there, Sim Rafters, how you doing? Thanks for clicking and welcome back to a series covering the storyline chapters in the game of Raft. If you're looking for a setup on the receiver in the first location, check the playlist link. There's also a guide on survival basics if you're just getting started. I saved the lore and the spoilers for the end, and I will warn ahead of time. Picking up from where we left off, the navigation of the last receiver's radar led us to an abandoned radio tower that provided a few clues to what transpired there. After finding the essential note with the coordinates, Trustworthy and I have punched the digits into the receiver, which can be found in the player journal by hitting the T key. The sailing was initially a smooth drift, but it took a turn for the difficult when closing in on the island. There was a lot of paddling involved, but hopefully you fare better than we did getting the wind to carry you. What we eventually find is what looks like a carbon fiber luxury yacht that's been beached in a precarious place. You'll want to pack for an overnight trip, including that headlight crafted from the blueprint found in the radio tower. It's quite useful to see your new nemesis, the Lurkers. In other words, these giant rats that are found at every level of this eerie ship. The squatter rodents can be killed at range with a few arrows, but a spear will also do. As with the radio tower, you're here for notes and blueprints, but in order to get them, there's going to be a little engineering to do while you're snooping about the decks. 15 notes in total here, plus the blueprints for the engine and the steering wheel part of the raft. The entrance can be found at the back of this carbon fiber looking structure here. There isn't much to get distracted by in the area. So when you get to the lower decks of the hallways, it's very dark. Uh, without that headlight, it would be hard to make out much of anything. But the first room is obvious from the equipment that it's an engine room. Within here, you'll be looking for a recorder and a crowbar that's necessary to pry open the door to get out of this room. It's also where you'll find your first note and the tape recorder. There's a few projects to do on this lower deck in the dark. Uh, after hulking open the engine room door crowbar style, run down the darkness and find a room at the end of the hallway. This room contains several workbenches and make note of it because you'll need several trips back here after gathering other quest items. But in order to gain access to this room, we'll need the red key. One of the three keys in total in this questing zone along with the blue and green. So first things first, the red key. Look around the lowest decks for the bathroom, and this is where you'll find that red key. After you return down the hallway, you can now get through the door, and on the other side, there'll be benches for assembling a bomb and a car jack. There's also a set of bolt cutters that you're gonna want to grab. Scattered mechanical components can be found throughout the ship, and after locating five of them, you can return to this room to assemble the car jack that will later be used. We'll have to cover nearly the entire ship to get all the parts required for the second thing, which is the bomb. First of which is the gas tank located in the kitchen along with a note. Once you've got those retrieved, there's a large storage room that's got a bunch of random loot in it, but also the blue key. You'll find it located in the locker, which is going to prompt you to use those bolt cutters. Grab the two notes in this area before leaving if you're planning on completing the journal. Signs for the stairs will lead you to the next passenger floors for the remainder of the story items. For the bomb in particular, we're looking for a lighter in the upper floor bedroom, a bullet in the bar, and some electrical wires in room 3 that'll be conveniently located right next to a 4 digit code that you'll need for another location. At some point you'll have to return to the lower deck to construct that car jack for the removal of the giant cabinet safe like object that's blocking the outer doorway. This provides access to yet another room where a note can be retrieved if you're going for completion. On the yacht's first floors, there's a note in the large ballroom entertainment area along with a bullet sitting on the bar, and if you look around on the tables, there should be an access card that'll be required later. In passenger room number three, at the back of the ship, look for a vault which will contain wires and an additional note. The green key opens the door for the passenger bedroom, which contains the bomb's lighter. You'll find that green key on the desk of a library. That library will become accessible after getting the key card from the large entertainment area, so just keep looking around for all of these random items. If you're going for all the notes, 
There's one on the fourth floor in what looks like a conference table, and the final three are in the steering control room on the top deck. Be mindful entering dark rooms, as you may find giant rats. Bring along a spear or a bow is definitely a good idea, and you might as well take your time looking around. Besides, uh, what else is there to do besides enjoy the game's scenery? Uh, I'm loving this game, so I don't want to just run through what it currently offers while it's still developing in early access. It's worth just savoring the content because the game gives you plenty to do, especially if you love to get creative with building your floating empire. The story environments can be quite a new view compared to the persistent watery horizon. The radio tower was decrepit and the abandoned yacht is just plain creepy. Some of the rooms look right out of a survival horror game. Once the lurkers make their appearance known, it's complete. A few moments of anxiety more than dealing with the shark or those few aggravating seagulls. The story island is even more unsettling than the last place was with the messages that were scrawled all over the building walls. But there's still stuff to read in here, some of which appears to be clues to what occurred other than the 15 notes that you're looking for as part of the storyline. After a little browse through the journal of what we found three quarters of the way up the boat, yep, already disturbing. If it wasn't obvious enough from the run aground ship, some really bad stuff happened here even before that. By now, you should have all the parts for making a bomb, so hustle back down to the lower deck to assemble it. You use this device to blow open the door of the very last room of the ship. I can confirm, the bomb will hit you for quite a few health points if it gets you, because I spaced out a little too long when Trustworthy placed it. I, I didn't really realize what was happening, I just heard the beeping, and a little too late that it occurred to me what the beeping was. Main control room contains the goods. The final notes and blueprints that definitely motivate a trustworthy and I to get to this location. Ah, finally! The engine schematics and the steering wheel to go with it that's right nearby. On the wheel in the steering room of the yacht, we'll have a post-it note right in the center for the coordinates to mark your next journey. If you've got everything you came for, it's now time to bail like a rat from the sinking ship. The rats that stuck around must have gotten into some nuclear waste. It's hard to imagine how the ship even ended up in this position, but if lucky enough to locate all the notes, you'll eventually know more. Or, um, keep watching this video because I got spoilers incoming. Okay, um, I think it's safe to spill it. But seriously, what the actual fuck went on here? All the signs, or rather notes here, point to some shady stuff happening all around this boat and its owner. We're just going to do a tour around the ship before getting the heck out. There's a scrap of an article that looks like it could be from a newspaper or a magazine with a photo of angled topped buildings that perhaps could match the place found in the photo of the radio tower's whiteboard. Was this the floating city of Utopia? The text underneath it leads us to realizing this isn't so good after all, that it may have been sabotaged and by the very person who owns the yacht you're on. If your hope of utopia was lost, perhaps so too was your hope in humanity. If your worst nightmare is being stranded at sea, slowly starving, wondering if you'll ever make it out alive, then cringe warning ahead in the journal collection. The first note foreshadows just how bad it's gotten when it appears that the crew member is listing off activities that the other crew members are involved in, from firing flares to blasting music, but the, the one that's trying to stop the flooding of the ship is not doing so well. When the second note references the weasel, it's hard to know if they're talking about the rat or Olaf, the ship's owner, because the list of his negligence starts to stack up into ensuring this vessel's demise. Subsequent notes are full of urgency about the level of food on board, while rats increasingly create electrical problems for the food storage and, worse yet, the engines, all of which is shrinking the clock on their survival. The beginning of one transmission from the tape recorder reads, Is this on? It better be. I've tried this three times already. Captain, again, I'm sorry, but let's face it, that fever of yours isn't looking like it's coming down. You were right. We went out into this blind, but nothing with a half-ass larder and no doctor. Larder being another word for food storage. The speaker is quite pessimistic that the travelers on the ship would survive this ordeal as they were, quote-unquote, coming apart at the seams, that they felt the need to take the ammunition away from the ship's owner and hide it, 
just speaks to what the crew thinks of this guy as a person, which she said has indeed caused to speculate the next transcribed passage is all of himself being a sad sack of shit. Hop up onto your psychologist's armchair lens for what he writes here. I admit that I ran, leaving behind my constituents in the Reformation Project. Perhaps the world wouldn't have drowned, but then again, I am only one man. Okay, so he knows he's a sack of crap too, but he tries to justify his actions don't matter, even if they drowned the world. What exactly does he mean by that anyway? Unfortunately, in my life, I've had to spend too much time trying to understand why billionaires will come up with logical fallacies to try to explain what happens in their lives. Only the particular decisions of the ones I know didn't involve sinking the globe. It's still an interesting trend. The mass media would like to present that these wealthy individuals is knowing what they're doing. I guess that's why I find Raph's storyline so powerful, because the truth is, is that they're not any more capable than anyone else. If anything, a rich guy will avoid anything he can fail at. Unless, of course, there's money to be gained from doing so. It's called failing up. Depraved as he was, there was a money-making opportunity to pad his own yacht in the Reformation Project, according to the article, about people's suspicions. When questioned about the activities surrounding the modifications of the yacht, he wanted to quickly push past it, talking about grand plans for the future. Sound familiar? After being told the boat's ready to go, he defends himself by saying, I'm only leaving this ship and the men out of necessity, not cowardice. He blames the captain's illness, further giving away how much trouble they were in, as if they were to lose the only member of their staff who can control this vessel. He goes on to rationalize that the world could use men like him. Sure, dude. I'm not sure the world needs him with his fail record, but you know rich people think they're superior in everything, including their real estate skills, is why they supposedly win at Monopoly even if they were given a double role advantage in research studies using the old board game as a test of character. I'll, uh, I'll link that study below. When Olaf's informed the fuel lines are cut, the recorder hears the crew chasing after Olaf trying to climb into a lifeboat. I doubt any of them wanted him to make a clean getaway. He was totally ready to leave them for dead to save himself, just like that after already being short-sighted on foods and vaccines. See, it turns out that the fever that we've learned about is tied to tetanus, and that the captain got it from cutting himself on a kitchen knife. By now in the story, it's progressed to Lockjaw and Delirium. You know, Alfred Hitchcock might have really approved of this one. There's a recording that catches two unknown figures who are snooping the contents of a room, I assume Olaf's, because one of them talks of mock-up plans for a city above water while the other insists it can't be true. The other voice is a recount of the story of a Chinese man found by the crew while lost at sea. Could it be the same one referenced in the radio tower notes? And that the man had talked of this place's existence before passing away. In the process of the retelling of the story, a figure is spotted in the distance and the shouting of no, no, no is heard on the recorder. The final two clues leave too many questions, more than they do answer. What we can gather is that the captain quote unquote went by that, she likely means he died considering his deteriorating condition in the news that someone else is now trying to steer the ship southward toward these rumored lands. The writer of this note is Henny, who appears to have gone with Olaf, perhaps as one of the entertainer ladies who were brought along on the trip, and that she's addressing someone she left behind to take this trip. She says, Olaf didn't have a clue, as if the person she's writing knew who that was, and that they were all tied to the Reformation Project somehow. Because the very last thing in this two-line-ish scrap of paper saying, The Reformation Terraforming Progress Report. Cape Town Basin Stabilized. Expected Yield of Niger Basin. It's hard to know exactly what any of that means to the plot just yet, but we'll keep it in mind. We can only hope that the people who left to head south after Henne's letter made it somewhere safe. Thanks, devs, for giving me the creeps to go with the story location. That made it all a little bit more weird, as if walking around the decaying ship doesn't already seem like a hazard to your health, but by now we might feel a little tinge of rage for these fictional beings for being sold out by spineless rich people who can not only afford to, but are the most likely to. It matches with something that many are pretty familiar with in current everyday life, especially when one lives in a place where much of the citizenry worships capitalism. 
being advantageous enough to be a criminal was all the rage. People actually wanted to grow up to be the wolf of Wall Street. Morality was somehow lost, and so was sanity along with it. If it wouldn't be the isolation of the endless seas, then the brain would still suffer the consequences of what an identity crisis does to a rich person when they can't reconcile their wealth with how much of a failure they are. The imposter syndrome is for real where I live in Silicon Valley. Fake it until you make it is literally their motto, and you'll see how it ends sometimes. Theranos was an example. Too bad so many failures, much smaller, go unnoticed that's no less reckless. I fear playing with nuclear fusion in this environment's mindset is almost ironic considering the storyline evolving in Raft, or maybe just terrifying. I just dug up a little funny summary of rich people here for you. There is a stereotype floating around out there that the poor are more likely to steal and lie, but the science reveals that stereotype couldn't be further from the truth. Hey friends, Lacey Green here for D News. In the past few years, there's been a lot of hubbub about the wealth gap in income equality and the 1%. Scientists are asking what are the real differences between the behavior of the rich and the poor? 30 studies have been conducted so far on wealth and behavior, and the results are pretty intense, actually. Prepare yourselves. Across the US, no matter what your political background, or where you live, the rich are consistently more likely to cheat, lie, steal, and be kind of terrible to other people. One of the studies published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences looked at driving behavior. They found that those who drove luxury vehicles were three to four times less likely to stop for a pedestrian. Those in higher status cars would often zoom through the crosswalk even when they saw that a pedestrian was standing there waiting, while the lower status cars almost always stopped. Another study tested lab participants honestly in a dice rolling game. The researchers told the participants that if they made the best dice rolls, they would win a prize. Using a hidden camera, they found that the participants who made over $150,000 a year were four times as likely to cheat than those who only made $15,000 a year. Yeah, the rich participants made about as much as the poor participants do per month. And what was the prize? 50 bucks. Moral of the story here, don't get rich or you'll become terrible. Or is it that you become rich because you were already terrible? Philosophical questions, y'all. Another study sheds some light here. It suggests that it's the wealth itself that taints our minds. It drives further greed and entitlement. In this experiment, hundreds of UC Berkeley students were paired up to play around a monopoly with each other. With a catch, the students were randomly assigned based on a dice roll to be rich or poor. The rich player started out with 2,000 more and they got to roll two dice. The poor player got no pay advantage and they could only roll with one die. So the game was rigged for the rich player to win, no matter what happened. But after the game, these unassuming innocent students who merely played rich said that they deserved to win. Girl, you won because the dice landed in your favor at the beginning of the game. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, you know what I'm saying? So these studies aren't necessarily groundbreaking. There were other studies that found that upper income folks are more likely to shoplift. A study in psychological science found lower empathetic accuracy in wealthy participants compared to the poor and uneducated. The poor also give a higher percentage of their money to charity than the rich do. I don't know, it kind of makes me have all these weird feelings about money and stuff. I mean, what does it all mean? There's more where that came from. Seriously, look up the studies on the wealthy. They're eye-opening. They're just flat out funny. It's still the plot twist about Raph that's grounding the game right into something more reality-based. How does the world end up drowned, some would wonder? I mean, wealthy people is probably going to be the answer to that question across a number of scenarios. Who needs zombie apocalypses anymore when greedy people are scarier? What else is pretty interesting is the increasingly bizarre interactions caught on the recorder. No secret that the ship was full of dysfunctional characters, and the dialogue does give some imagery to their less than savory behavior or treatment of each other. It doesn't necessarily suggest that they were the friendliest of colleagues, that they weren't above stealing food from passing by rafters, but in doing so would only buy themselves two weeks' time. I think these characters just reinforce the cautionary tale that the only way to win is not to play. Trusting these types might as well be signing a death warrant, especially if they can see you as lower within their structure of class hierarchy. Just a pawn somewhere in their game of life, which you can tell they don't even take seriously themselves if they're willing to forgo the consequences of not having adequate food or medicines on board. If it isn't a straight up sellout to save their own ass, it's just going to be carelessness. And I gather that it's going to be an evolving theme. 
probably just escalating the desperate behavior in the game. It's hard to refute that the writers of Raph know what this experience is like too. It's right there in the notes. Look at all the carelessness, betrayal, and just good old human depravity. That's not just a good plot, it's also a very scary one. Truly terrifying. Not manufactured horror or fantasy monsters, nah, the real ones. The environments are unsettling, but the notes left take this to a psychological horror a step further by letting you know what happened here was just, oh, some insidious human condition problem. One that we all have to fear even now, or especially now. Rich people are still controlling too many switches on your environment with all their <coughs> bullshit and their lobbying. They can be every bit as incompetent as Raf proposes that they are during a world-ending crisis. These little mutated rat lurkers ain't nothing compared to the greedy rats that exploit this planet and society. Oh, now I imagine some are going to be a little upset by this information and think I'm just talking <coughs> but hey, we all have these kind of problems with science denial lately. This wouldn't be any different. You can just bank on the wealthy people not having any ethics. There's actually a physical reason that has to do with how the brain can be structured. Someday in a video I'll talk about what an anti-psychopath is. Oh, wait, you didn't know that was a thing? Psychopathy is a spectrum and there's an opposite to it. So this idea that all humans are self-interested is certainly debunked, but I'm sure that you've heard people still trying to use that idea as a rationalized excuse for their own bad behavior. But, bravo Raft developers, in no small way does this plot grab and pull one back into the game. It certainly gives me a reason to keep coming back for every chapter released. I sincerely hope it gets people thinking about how so many disasters in history have been preceded by careless human decisions. I recommend the Fascinating Horror Channel on YouTube. Many of the videos there demonstrate what happens when humans don't think of the consequences. Then there's why someone having wealth isn't a reason to trust an individual or their judgment. Qualification matters, especially when saving the planet from being sunk is at stake. I've been droning on long enough. Well, getting the next set of coordinates for Balboa Island with the latest set of story notes, there's a ton more to be curious about. And what happened to this crew? The last of the communications left by the letter in the tape recorder don't sound too positive. If Olaf did make it away with the lifeboat, how far did he get and is this jerk still alive? We'll see if Balboa has any answers for us. Until then, take care all and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye bye